How about those Wildcats defeated the seventh seeded Dayton 78 to 68 Saturday afternoon? They are in their seventh Sweet 16 since 2011. One thing is key is they have held their foes to 36.6% field goal percentage in this tournament, and they will now face Clemson on Thursday, and they are the last Pac-12 team in the March Madness before this conference dissolves. And joining us now is the color analyst who's been nice enough to join us throughout the tournament. We hope we'll be talking to him all the way up until uh, April 8th. We'll have him on the show, hopefully, as uh, we'll be uh, broadcasting here at uh, Talking Stick Resort in Casino, Arizona, as Ryan Hansen joins us now. Ryan, Rock, Minute, Jimmy B, as always, thanks for making time for us. And uh, it's, you're not blowing out teams, but you're doing enough to win. And uh, now this is you got the first weekend over. Now what is the biggest hurdle you think this team is going to have moving forward? You know, that's a great point. You just got to win by one, right? In yeah. March. It's about surviving and advancing and how it's not about the eye test and how pretty you look. It ain't a beauty contest. It's about getting one more point than your opponent. And as I look at what happened over the weekend and what Arizona is going to need to ramp up, the next level for Arizona is just, it's about what we've seen all season, locking in for more than 20 minutes, more than 30 minutes. You know, every round you have seen Arizona play, they've played better and they've consistently strung together that effort that we've seen in spurts. You look at the Dayton game, there was less time where they kind of didn't look like themselves against Clemson and then potentially beyond. You need to start tightening that up even more. You almost have to be on for as much of the 40 minutes as possible because any couple of minutes or a couple of possessions and you're going home against a very good team. All right, so let's get into the little breakdown action here. P.J. Hall is an NBA player. He is the pivot man for Clemson. They also have Shefflin as well. So my question to you is, when you look at those two big guys, how is Arizona going to defend those two guys? And if P.J. Hall steps out near the three-point line, if Ballo is on him, is he going to follow him out there? You know, those are great questions, and that is the chess match that we're going to be we're going to be watching very closely. And we saw a little glimpse of it in the Dayton game with Deron Holmes, who is a versatile big man, a good three-point shooter, not the volume that P.J. Hall puts up, uh, but could definitely face up. And he knocked down two threes on Arizona. Uh, but Balo had his way as well in a stretch of the first half. So it's not going to be completely abandoned Umar Balo. Uh, you're going to get steady doses of him. Uh, but I'm going to lean a lot in my commentary on the versatility of Keisha Johnson in the post and his, his defensive, you know, toolbox of being able to guard in the post against a big guard on the perimeter against a mobile big or even smaller guys. And then Arizona, as you saw, Jimmy B. In the second half, the last 10 minutes of the game, Arizona went small. Mm -hmm. Umar Balo played about 90 seconds of the last 10 minutes. And so you could argue in winning time, which lineup was on the floor? It was no Balo, no Boswell for Arizona in the last 10 minutes against Dayton. Right now, that appears to be the most potent lineup and the most versatile lineup defensively that they have. But you can't play that lineup 40 minutes. So you have to sprinkle some different looks in. And Umar Balo may have to he may have to guard in space a little bit, but you don't want to change your core philosophy defensively. And PJ Hall, he may hit a couple threes. That may be what happens. You just can't allow him to get hot. You know, Ryan, it's interesting to hear Tommy Lloyd talk after these 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 pressers and how he's uh, was like the little brother that can now that he's has no problem whooping up on some of these older coaches per se. I thought that was very interesting. It's a Aside of Tommy Lloyd, I don't think we've really heard that he's motivated just as much as his employees. I thought that was interesting. He's He's got a little burn his saddle, too, to go ahead and prove some of these older guys wrong, or should say the NCAA wrong. Yeah, no doubt. When you look at the first game against Dan Monson, it, ironically, Dan Monson hired Tommy yes. at Gonzaga as a graduate assistant. So there was a relationship there. Tommy never coached for him because Dan Monson – took the job at Minnesota uh, in the off season that he had hired Tommy. And then obviously working for Mark few, uh, you know, there is a, and Mark with Gonzaga being in Salt Lake there with us, there was this old home week feeling and you are right. Uh, Dan Monson doing it a long time. Mark few doing it at an extremely high level for a long time. And Tommy, 
you know, he's just now cementing himself. It's and the cement's not dry. Tommy's got to make a run, right, to establish himself. Mm -hmm. And I do see him. He's got an edge about him this year. And I'm not saying he didn't want to win last year or the year before, but there's a little extra a chip on that shoulder this year from Tommy. And I think that's a good thing for Arizona. They need Tommy Lloyd to stay true to himself as a player's coach, but a little edge, I think, kind of cascades down to the team. So you, we, we talked last week about Dayton in reference to what team matched up during the season. You, you talked about Oregon last week, right? Now what team you got Clemson coming? And is there a team that's somewhat similar that you played against this last year, whether it be in the Pac-12 or outside of the conference, so you can reflect off of? You know, when I look at uh, just from an, from an efficiency standpoint, so how well they uh, Clemson operates their offense, shoot the ball at a high level overall from a field goal percentage. They're not deadly from beyond the arc, but they're more than sufficient. When I look at those stats and metrics, I see Colorado. Uh, I don't see exactly the personnel doesn't line up. Their big is more of a traditional big at Colorado with Eddie Lampkin. He's not shooting three. So personnel is not exactly the same, but – just the way in which Clemson goes about their business. Uh, they're extremely efficient, and they have beaten good teams, but they went through a stretch in the ACC where they lost, and they had some head-scratching losses uh, that you could argue at Notre Dame, uh, Georgia Tech, you know, Virginia. Eh, you know, Virginia's a tournament team, but we saw how, how you know, bad they were offensively here recently. So you, you do have some question marks at Clemson, like, they can beat the top teams, but are they consistently being able to string it together? I, that's kind of my, my, my closest comparison today. All right. I want to follow up. Normally in college basketball, it is great guard play that translates in the tournament. And there still are some, some great guards. But this year, I find it really interesting that it is the big men who are dictating what is happening. We just talked about Arizona's big guys. We talked about what Clemson has with their two big guys in Hall and Shefflin. Look what Purdue has. Look what Carolina has. I mean, it just, and, and, and look what uh, UConn has. How did it change? What happened there, Ryan? I'm really curious because before it was all about the guards, and now as you get into the Sweet 16, it seems to be all about the centers. Yeah, it's a very good point, Jimmy B. The, the transition from youth to being old as well. If mm -hmm. you throw in the one-and-done era and look at what, uh, and I'm not saying that was John Calipari's demise at Kentucky this year, but I think it contributed uh, the the older you are, the better now versus the one and done. The bigs are are kind of it's a a renaissance a little bit in college basketball as you threw out Donovan Klingon and and what uh, Zach Eady's doing and just in our bracket look at Armando Baycott at North Carolina he's he's impacting play. I do think though as this as the tournament pushes through. You still better have guards that can create opportunities for their teammates in addition to themselves. And they Two. have more weapons now that they're utilizing the bigs. But I still think when the game's on the line, Alabama's Marcus Sears is going to step up and make a play. UConn's Tristan Newton is going to be the guy with the ball in his hand. And will he dish it to Klingon? And Klingon finishes, so everybody think it's Klingon, but it's actually what Tristan Newton did. Or is it one of the guards from Purdue that is making it happen, and Zach Eady gets an offensive rebound, right? It's, it's those types of plays. So I still think perimeter play will rule the day as you get deeper and deeper in the tournament. And, and Ryan, my last question for you, it seems as though U of A during the year, they would blow teams out, and they get comfortable you know, beating teams. Uh, and then, then you'd see a game where they have a clunker where they lose their focus or concentration. How does Tommy Lloyd keep this team up or continue to play urgently under control like they are almost – not quite desperate, but they're focused, they're dialed in. How does he keep that kind of state of mind with this team moving forward to Sweet 16? That's a great point uh, that we have seen, right? Pedal One minute. Pedal against Oregon in the Pac-12 tournament, and you give up a lead. Uh, we saw Dayton, obviously, went on a run. Uh, my famous line is, is, other teams want to win too. And so they're going to they're gonna do everything they can, make chess matches and changes to their, their situation. How about, by the way, did you see Houston give up a 12-point lead with yeah. a minute and 10 seconds left to Texas A&M, right? It happens. 
it happens in basketball, but I think you're really pointing out the key is you have to recognize if you're playing in these games that every possession could be the possession, capital T-H-E. And you cannot allow teams to seize momentum because this game is a very momentum swinging game in college athletics uh, with the emotions. And so you got to understand things are going well, but you are one shot, one foul, one turnover away from it swinging the other way. And you hope that Arizona has learned their lesson. You hope that the film from the Dayton game where cats are up 14 in the first half and Caleb Love has the ball and he tries to thread the needle through three Dayton defenders to a Keisha Johnson streaking player running down the floor. And guess what happens? Goes the other way, dunk Dayton. They go on a 10-0 run and now Arizona's only up seven and a half, right? That, that's what you're speaking to. So still a long way to go, but it's part of, I believe, why we love college athletics and why we love college basketball is the runs, the spurtability, as Clark Kellogg coined one year, the spurtability of this game makes you, you know, stay locked into the game. And you got to love, Ryan, as we let you go, it should be a, a, a home game there in Los Angeles on Thursday with Clemson. It's hard to travel. My, my, my sister, my brother-in-law all went to Clemson, and I know they're not making that trip. So it should be a lot of cats there in, in, uh, in L.A. Yeah, not only easy to get from Tucson and Phoenix, but the alumni base, the SoCal alumni base there in L.A. and San Diego is strong. And they, my hunch is a lot of those people probably bought tickets for this event before the tournament even started with their fingers crossed that the Cats would be back in L.A. And here we are. And now you got to go do your job. And here's, I'll leave you with this. Arizona's been in the Elite Eight four times in Southern California in a row and has lost in the Elite Eight four times. So oh. home game doesn't always translate to advancement. We need to break that curse. You guys, streaks are made to be broken. Hey, Ryan, thanks as always, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Well, hopefully, we'll, hey, hope we're talking next Monday about, uh, about a Final Four there in Phoenix. We can do a live remote. Yes, we'll do it. That's Ryan Hansen, the University of Arizona Radio Color Annals, has been with us all March, and we'll continue, hopefully, as the Cats and Clemson, the Tigers, on Thursday at 7 o'clock. Hey, coming up, uh, turn the channel to 